thanking the Institute for the honor of this invitation and Ruth for the extraordinary honor of that introduction is really, um, may everyone have the blessing of friendship uh, and colleagueship of the kind that I consider myself uh, to have. It's really um, a treasure. Um, so uh, I'll leap right in. Um, People let me know if you cannot hear. I've been told that there's an issue with sound in the room. So just in the back, stick your hands up if you can't hear. In the decades before the United States Supreme Court recognized the right of same-sex couples to marry under the United States Constitution in Obergefell versus Hodges, Americans denounced and debated same-sex marriage. When state courts recognized the right of same-sex couples to marry under their own state constitutions, opponents of same-sex marriage amended the state constitutions to define marriage as the union of a man and a woman. This fierce conflict provoked argument about the capacity of courts to, to defend minority rights. Can courts enforce judgments that challenge the beliefs and the prerogatives of the privileged? Critics argued that same-sex marriage decisions shutting down democratic debate were counterproductive and provoked backlash that exacerbated political polarization. Conversation about backlash ranged widely from academics to advocates to judges. These realist accounts of judicial review depicted courts as majoritarian institutions whose authority is tied to public consensus. In this lecture, I will argue that the backlash narrative and the consensus model of constitutionalism on which it rests simultaneously underestimates and overestimates the power of judicial review. The court's decision in Obergefell was possible not simply because public opinion changed, but also because the struggle over the courts helped change public opinion and forge new constitutional understandings. Even so, Obergefell has not ended debate over same-sex marriage, but instead has channeled it into new forms. Opponents of same-sex marriage now assert rights of conscience and religious liberty to resist recognizing the rights of same-sex couples. We understand constitutions as reflecting consensus and look to courts to settle conflict over their meaning. But in this lecture, I will be arguing that courts play an important role in structuring conflicts that they cannot settle. I will employ concepts of constitutional culture to explore how constitutions can give contested legal beliefs legal form and structure conflicts in ways that help sustain community in the midst of disagreement. I start by locating the puzzle about which I'm speaking in my work. I was taught law by professors who came of age in the civil rights revolution defending Brown versus Board in the work of the Supreme Court, that is, the liberal court of Chief Justice Warren. But I myself grew up at a very different time. Not only was the court the object of popular protest, the Supreme Court had evolved in membership in much, much more conservative directions, so that there was a growing gap between the court about which I was taught in law school and the judgments of the court under which I was then living. The Supreme Court's future direction is today in controversy even as we speak. Depending on the outcome of this fall's election in the United States, federal courts could move sharply in more progressive or more conservative directions. The United States courts are not infrequently the focus of electoral dispute of the kind we face today because we have an, a very old constitution that is the object of popular veneration because the judges who interpret the Constitution are appointed to federal courts for life, because the representative branches of government have power to appoint the judges, the president appoints with the advice and consent of the Senate, which is being tested now even as we speak, and because from time to time, the Supreme Court has intervened in legislative affairs in disruptive ways, in ways that engage and arouse the public the court's role in declaring racial segregation unconstitutional is the most famous of these. But the court has also intervened to protect the rights of the criminally accused, to prohibit school prayer, to prohibit sex discrimination, to protect the right to contraception and abortion, and much, much more. And these judgments, invalidating customary laws and practices of the majority, have been the focal point of sustained protest over the decades. <clears throat> 
They have provoked citizens to go to the polls to protest and in different ways to restrain, to block, and to redirect the work of judges. Political parties and organizations in civil society have developed norms and practices that allow them to monitor and to interact with courts. Perhaps because I came of professional age at a time when protests led to the reorientation of the federal courts, I have not infrequently spent time thinking about the interaction of adjudication and politics in the United States. My talk today on the capacity of courts to defend minority rights is no exception. In talking about conflict over same-sex marriage, I've chosen a topic of continuing current interest. But it is of interest to me not only because of the rights of sexual minorities, because they are of interest to me, but also because the evolution of same-sex marriage law in the United States presents a rich case for thinking about the relationship of courts and politics. Unlike the cases of racial desegregation and abortion about which I have also written, <clears throat> the same-sex marriage case is now taken by many to be an easy case for judicial review. But it was not always so understood. To the contrary, it was for decades seen as a dangerous case for judicial intervention. I've been drawn to investigate the question precisely because the same-sex same -sex marriage prompted public debate about the role of courts and because judgments about the capacity of courts to intervene in this case have shifted so dramatically over time. What follows is a story about same-sex marriage and the counter-majoritarian possibilities of judicial review. I do not offer a normative account in any simple sense. In trying to give a descriptive account, however, I will discuss debates about the interactions of courts and politics in one legal system over one question over time. As I hope to show you, however, even cabined in this way, the descriptive question is not at all a simple one. Nor is the descriptive or positive question so plainly, sharply separate from normative questions, as I trust you'll see as I get into my story. And listening to this story about constitutional conflict over same-sex marriage in the United States, you might also hear questions for national and regional courts in Europe. But how are we to compare? On what relationships ought we focus in thinking about points of similarity and difference in our respective constitutional cultures? On understandings of sexuality in the family across the United States and Europe? Or should we focus instead on what is like and different in our respective federalisms? As importantly, we might ask, what are the understandings that citizens and officials draw on when they engage in conflicts over courts in different constitutional democracies? As you will hear, I model the US story in ways that treat all of these relationships as significant dimensions of constitutional culture. All are potentially relevant if we want to think comparatively about the ways that constitutional culture enables constitutional change. I proceed with my story about the struggle over courts in the US and look forward to your questions about the way I've modeled the US case and about puzzling together over the questions of comparison that it raises. In 1972, the United States Supreme Court refused to recognize a same-sex marriage claim. That's in 1972. Four decades later, in 2015, the court held that a state law defining marriage as the union of a man and a woman denied same-sex couples a right to marry protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. In the four decades between the court's two marriage decisions, a great debate raged over the constitutional protections afforded gays and lesbians. In 1986, the Supreme Court ruled in Bowers versus Hardwick that the United States Constitution allowed states to criminalize same-sex sex. A decade later, without mention of its decision in Bowers versus Hardwick, the court imposed modest limits on the ability of legislators to discriminate against gays. In 2003, the court reversed Bowers and ruled in Lawrence versus Texas that laws criminalizing same-sex sodomy denied gays dignity, liberty, and equality protected by the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. The marriage debate unfolded in the midst of this tumult. In the 1990s, courts began to recognize the, the rights of same-sex couples to marry under state constitutions, first in Hawaii and Alaska. But citizens mobilized against these early state constitutional decisions. In 1996, the United States Congress enacted the Defense of Marriage Act, which defined marriage for purposes of federal tax and benefits law as the union of a man and a woman, 
and allowed states to refuse to recognize same-sex unions solemnized in other states. Soon after, citizens overturned the Hawaii and Alaska decisions by amending their state constitutions to define marriage as the relationship between a man and a woman. This pattern recurred. In 2003, months after the Supreme Court struck down a law criminalizing same-sex sodomy in Lawrence, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ruled in Goodrich versus Department of Public Health that denial of marriage licenses to same-sex couples violated the state constitution. Again, Americans mobilized to block the spread of same-sex marriage. In a majority of states, citizens enacted a wave of laws and state constitutional amendments that prohibited marriage between same-sex couples. A movement to ban same-sex marriage by amending the United States Constitution drew conservatives to the polls in 2004 presidential election, with many attributing President Bush's margin of victory to the marriage debate. Amidst these developments, a growing number of commentators began to argue that popular reaction to decisions recognizing the right of same-sex couples to marry demonstrated the impotence of courts to vindicate minority rights. According to the judicial backlash thesis, courts striking down popular legislation to vindicate minority rights were not only ineffective, but counterproductive. Judicial decisions shutting down politics could frustrate Democratic majorities in ways that would produce more virulent politics than might have resulted had judges refused to intervene. In a prominent article published in 2005, Professor Michael Klarman, now of the Harvard Law School, compared response to Goodrich, the Massachusetts marriage decision, to massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education. He argued that, quote, court rulings such as Brown and Goodrich produce political backlashes for three principal reasons. They raise the salience of an issue, they excite, incite anger over outside interference or judicial activism, and they alter the order in which social change would otherwise have occurred. Romance about Brown was romance only. Courts were poor vehicles for social change, Klarman argued. Quote, judicially mandated social reform may mobilize greater resistance than change accomplished through legislatures or with the acquiescence of other democratically operated institutions. Close quote. Laws through litigation specially enraged citizens accustomed to self-government. Quote, because Goodrich was a court decision rather than a reform adopted by voters or popularly elected legislators, critics were able to deride it as the handiwork of arrogant activist judges defying the will of the people, close quote. In the short run, at least, Klarman emphasized litigation can lead to perverse results, quote, by outpacing public opinion on issues of social reform, such rulings mobilize opponents, undercut moderates, and retard the cause they purport to advance, close quote. Klarman was joined by political, science, Ger political scientist Gerald Rosenberg, best known for the argument that racial desegregation resulted from the enforcement of federal civil rights laws and not from the court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education, a decision he famously called the hollow hope. It's the title of his book. Court decisions could consolidate social change, but courts could not prompt social change, Rosenberg argued. He pointed to the many laws and amendments enacted to ban same-sex marriage. Quote, the problem is that activists for same-sex marriage turn to the courts too soon in the reform process. Only when political, social, and economic forces have already pushed society far along the road toward reform will courts have any independent effect, he continued. Quote, and even then, he argued, their decisions may be more a reflection of significant social reform already occurring than an independent important contribution to it. That change is yet to occur with same-sex marriage, so litigation as a method of social reform is premature, close quote. His bottom line, quote, the battle for same-sex marriage would have been better served if advocates had never brought litigation or had lost their cases, close quote. Concern about backlash to the court's decisions recognizing the right to marry was not only limited to academics. Faced with litigation losses and warnings of backlash, gay rights litigators assumed a self-consciously cautious litigation strategy. Inaugurating campaigns to educate the public before filing suit in state courts and seeking at all costs to avoid suit under the federal constitution. In 2008, when lawyers who were not affiliated with the gay rights movement prepared to challenge state marriage bans under the United States Constitution in Hollingworth versus Perry, 
Lawyers in the gay rights movement worked to stop the lawsuit, trying to stop these lawyers from bringing the case. How would the public respond to a court decision recognizing the constitutional right of same-sex couples to marry that changed the law in all 50 states? As the Perry case made its way toward the Supreme Court, along with the Windsor case challenging the constitutionality of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, a variety of liberal and conservative academics and advocates urged judges to narrow or avoid decisions in these cases, warning the Supreme Court that a court decision striking down state marriage bans could trigger powerful backlash. Even Supreme Court justices joined the conversation. In several public interviews in 2012 and 2013, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg offered not so veiled warnings about the dangers of a Supreme Court decision in Perry by reiterating her view that an early and overbroad ruling in Roe versus Wade had caused backlash. The court should not move too far too fast. When the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act in Windsor but ruled that the parties in Perry lacked standing to bring the case, the court essentially ruled that there were justiciability issues in the Perry case, Justice Kennedy in dissent objected that the court should not have avoided the merits and adverted to, judici to judicial concerns about backlash as he did so. Instead, with the Windsor and Perry decisions, the problem was sent back to the lower federal and state courts. Over the years, talk of backlash had changed shape and assumed variant forms. Did backlash concern the question whether courts could intervene in democratic politics and vindicate minority rights? or whether judges should intervene in democratic politics and vindicate minority rights? Or was the concern about backlash not a whether question, but a when question? At what point in the evolution of public opinion should a lower court or the Supreme Court itself intervene? When in 2015, the court finally recognized the right to marry, Chief Justice Roberts dissented, quoting Justice Ginsburg on the backlash that judicial decision in the abortion case Roe versus Wade had provoked. But Professor Michael Klarman disagreed. By the time of Obergefell, he was arguing that the court could decide the question of marriage without concern of backlash because there was now major majority public support for marriage. And further because he argued that Obergefell, unlike Brown or Roe, was unlikely to have, it was likely to have, quote, little direct impact on opponents' lives. The judicial backlash thesis spread not only because of the statutes, amendments, and initiatives enacted to block court decisions protecting the right of same-sex couples to marry, but also because the judicial backlash thesis echoed widespread realist views about the institution of judicial review. In the least dangerous branch, law professor Alexander Bickel famously characterized the institution of judicial review as counter-majoritarian. But scholars in political science in the United States have long reasoned differently, following the work of political scientist Robert Dahl, who characterized courts as majoritarian institutions. In an admiring account, backlash theorist Gerald Rosenberg observed of Dahl, quote, first he found that the court historically had seldom strayed from the policy wishes of the lawmaking majority, generally failing to protect minorities against majoritarian outcomes. Second, he found that when the court did stray from the policy wishes of the lawmaking majority, Congress overturned those decisions. Backlash theorist Michael Klarman also acknowledges his indebtedness to Dahl. These views have increasingly spread in the American Legal Academy, where academics have long argued in the shadow of the counter-majoritarian difficulty, a shift in outlook on judicial review that may reflect the experience of living with the Supreme Court under fire whose membership and interpretation of the Constitution has shifted dramatically over the decades and is about to shift again. In these realist accounts of judicial review, courts are tied to representative government through judicial appointments or conform to the will of the majority in a quest to avoid political reprisals and secure popular compliance with their judgments. Courts can issue judgments that force regional minorities, so-called outliers, to conform to majority views, but courts cannot issue judgments that step too far ahead of popular opinion. So what is wrong with realist accounts that emphasize the importance of public opinion in judicial decisions? It seems clear enough that public opinion does play an important role. A, a Supreme Court decision recognizing same-sex marriage in 2015 
when by some measures 58% of the American public supports marriage equality, is surely less controversial than it would have been at the time of the Hawaii decision in the 1990s. But one can acknowledge the decisive importance of judicial appointments and public opinion without treating majority support as indispensable or as sufficient to sustain a constitutional ruling as realist accounts often do. For example, Michael Klarman voiced what I believe is a widely shared intuition when he asserted that the court could decide Obergefell because public support had tipped in favor of marriage. Once the public supports a particular constitutional understanding, so this view holds, the court can vindicate that view and impose it on regional outliers. This account of judicial review is unsatisfying for a variety of reasons. My own sense is that the backlash narrative and the consensus model of constitutionalism on which it rests leads us to underestimate and to overestimate the power of judicial review. Talk of backlash and consensus constitutionalism, <clears throat> talk of backlash and consensus constitutionalism depicts judicial review as reflecting and restrained by public opinion. Yet innumerable court and legislative decisions preceded Obergefell as appendices to the court's own opinion acknowledge, with many of these decisions growing out of the Supreme Court's earlier decisions in Lawrence and Windsor. The court's decision in Obergefell was possible not simply because public opinion changed, but also because the struggle over the courts helped change public opinion and forge new constitutional understandings. At the same time, Consensus constitutionalism may overestimate the power of judicial review. The story of courts enforcing social consensus and re repressing regional outliers imputes to judicial review more power than I believe courts have. Just as Brown did not end debate over racial segregation, Obergefell has not ended debate over marriage, but instead has channeled it into new forms. Public support for gay marriage has risen dramatically over the last decade, but many Americans remain passionately opposed, especially when it tends to differences in age, region, religion, and political party. These Americans are mobilizing to continue the fight over marriage under the banner of conscience and religious liberty in the courts as well as in campaigns for the presidency. What leads to these common forms of realist thought that underestimate and overestimate the power of judicial review? I believe the backlash narrative and consensus constitutionalism are persuasive, not only because they reflect assumptions about the power of majority decision making, but also because they assume a familiar model of judicial review. They assume that courts settle conflict and that courts that fail to settle conflict have failed in their essential mission. Judicial review does serve crucial conflict resolution goals. But as I will emphasize in the remainder of my remarks, conflict resolution is not judicial review's sole function. When courts and other government officials interpreting the Constitution lack power to impose particular constitutional settlements, they may still shape political conflict in ways that advance constitutional values. Law and politics help constitute one another in many ways by changing meanings, and by altering the legitimacy conditions of political and legal argument. Advocates appreciate this. They advocate to win and to shape debate when they cannot. In what follows, I look back at backlash to same-sex marriage from the vantage point of my work on social movement conflict and constitutional change. I'm interested briefly in considering how fight over the courts and other sites of government decision making help structure conflict and infuse it with new constitutional meaning. I contrast structuring conflict with settling conflict, but do so provisionally and with caution. Structuring conflict is not always a self-conscious aim of advocates or officials. To the contrary, as we begin to look at constitutional decision making as reiterated across the system and over time, we can think about individual decisions as having multiple and intersecting logics. State courts were interpreting their own state constitutions and participating in the opening phases of a dialogue about the meaning of the federal constitution, as those who mobilized for and against them well appreciated. Constitutional conflict played out over the decades in lower and in apex courts, in representative government, in struggles over amendments, laws, and referenda, and in civil society. 
Conflict can have constructive effects. Without a doubt, the first decisions recognizing same-sex marriage sparked a conflict that in the short run produced immense setbacks. Yet it was precisely by amplifying the claims of despised minorities in the legislative process that courts changed the shape of the conflict and infused it with new meanings. Opponents mobilized to ban same-sex marriage because they understood that court decisions recognizing the claim had imbued it with increasing legitimacy. Counter-mobilization was a response to the claim's growing power. Debate widened as advocates on each side tried to justify their views to wider publics to whom government officials were accountable. The first marriage decisions thus had mixed effects. As a growing number of commentators have observed, Goodrich and other early decisions not only set back the cause of same-sex marriage, they also strengthened the claim's authority in a variety of significant ways. The early decisions were, as Robert Cover might put it, juris generative. The early court decisions amplified minority claims. Court decisions made claims for same-sex marriage visible and audible in ways they were not in the ordinary legislative process. For better or worse, court decisions put same-sex marriage on the public agenda. The early court decisions helped legitimate unconventional claims. Court decisions changed the conditions of debate about same-sex marriage in a variety of ways. Goodrich and early state court decisions created actual married same-sex couples, and through these actual role models allowed the nation to learn, to explore the consequences of same-sex marriage for same-sex relationships, for children, and for the larger community. As importantly, as advocates made arguments for marriage equality to the public and to the courts, they challenged stereotypes about gay sex and created counter images of the family life of same-sex couples. The debate transformed arguments about marriage into a referendum on the citizenship status of gays and lesbians so that it came to pose the question of their equal membership in the community. The right to marry posed the question of equal citizenship for gays and lesbians, much as the right to vote once raised questions of sex equality for women, and the right to attend integrated schools raised questions of race equality for African Americans. The early court decisions had a variety of social mobilization effects. The decisions influenced movement goals. The more the argument over marriage turned into a referendum on the equal status of gays in the community, the more the LGBT movement invested in the question. A movement that once understood itself as seeking sexual freedom came to understand itself through the institution of the family. The decisions fostered movement dialogue. As advocates on each side attempted to persuade decision makers accountable to wider publics, each side was obliged to answer arguments of the other, and in the process incorporated elements of the other's views. LGBT advocates responded to conservative arguments by espousing fidelity to family values, and defenders of traditional marriage responded to liberal arguments by espousing commitments to equality values. Conflict strains social bonds, and for this good reason, we rarely notice the bonds that constitutional conflict can create. Because we understandably view constitutional conflict as a threat to social cohesion, it is worth considering how conflict over the Constitution could also function to sustain community across disagreement. To illustrate, I pause briefly to consider how, over decades of conflict, objections to same-sex marriage changed in form from gay denigrating to gay respecting modes of constitutional argument. It is not simply that many opponents shifted ground and conceded the equal citizenship of gays, offering same-sex couples recognition through civil unions instead of marriage. The constitutional arguments they offered in objection to same-sex marriage changed also. In the 1980s and 90s, it was commonplace to oppose same-sex marriage by depicting it as deviant and immoral. The Defense of Marriage Act has a legislative history of this kind. But in the aftermath of the Supreme Court decisions according gays rudimentary protections against discrimination, objections to same-sex marriage began to shift into a gay respecting mode. In the 2000s, litigants and judges began to justify limiting marriage to different sex couples in terms of the needs and vulnerabilities of heterosexuals. <laughs> 
Heterosexual couples needed incentives to marry, opponents argued. This is the so-called accidental procreation argument. And children needed different sex parents to model gender roles for them. It's the dual gender marriage argument. Conservative op opponents of marriage objected to being outcast as bigots. That's constantly objecting to being called a bigot. And asserted the importance of preserving traditional marriage to protect religious liberty. Opposition to same-sex marriage increasingly narrowed to a claim about the proper role of courts. There might, so there might in fact be a case for recognizing same-sex marriage, opponents argued, but in a constitutional democracy, the question was for determination by legislatures, not courts. So there's sort of evolving emphasis in the argument here. Evolving objections to marriage signaled rising respect for gays, even among opponents of marriage. These changes in the grounds of constitutional argument illustrate how constitutional conflict can foster relationships even among adversaries who fiercely disagree about the meaning of constitutional norms to which they share fealty. The judicial backlash thesis does not treat as significant these changes in the shape of conflict over same-sex marriage. One reason why, I suspect, is that backlash theory, at least in its full-throated form, is premised on the familiar understanding of judicial review and social conflict. Courts are supposed to settle social conflict, and persisting constitutional conflict is evidence that courts have failed to settle the conflict or have no proper role addressing the question in the first place. With its expectation that courts should settle conflict, the backlash framework evaluates judicial review in a short time horizon and tends to rely on opinion polls and other practices of counting laws to identify circumstances in which courts can successfully intervene and resolve long-running social conflict. But a great many constitutional questions are the locus of intractable conflict. Making judgments about the role of courts in the backlash framework with its short time horizons and attachment to opinion polling depicts courts and conflict in, term that leaves, in terms that leave advocates and officials reticent to act in some circumstances and overconfident about their efficacy in others. After years of writing about social movement conflict and constitutional change in the areas of race and sex and reproduction and religion and guns, I've come to expect persisting conflict with respect to many, although surely not all, important constitutional questions. In closing, then, I'd like us to consider how we might differently understand judicial review under conditions of conflict. In past writing on social movement conflict and constitutional change, I've employed concepts of constitutional culture to explore how constitutions can give contested beliefs, legal form, and structure conflict in ways that help sustain community in disagreement. On one understanding of constitutional culture, Constitutional culture refers to the norms, values, and beliefs of a society that penetrate and shape its constitutional law. This understanding of constitutional culture focuses our attention on the ways that social norms influence legal norms. But I've used constitutional culture in a different sense. We could even call it constitutional culture sub two to get at this other sense, to focus attention not on social norms, but on features of law. Constitutional culture in the second sense concerns the understandings about legal roles and the forms of legal argument that citizens and officials draw on when they disagree about the Constitution's meaning. Citizens and officials literate in these understandings of role and practices of argument can make new claims on constitutional law, claims that diverge from orthodox or established legal understandings. In this way, citizens and officials drawing on constitutional culture, sub two, can open law to contested social norms and use law to help forge changes in social norms. Citizens and officials draw on constitutional culture in the second sense to make role-informed judgments about the actions and arguments that can best guide constitutional development. These efforts help steer constitutional development over time and promote the attachment, the fidelity to the constitutional order of those who may be deeply estranged from the official or orthodox or uh, uh, formal pronouncements of the law as it stands in the present. Looking back at debates preceding and following Obergefell through the lens of constitutional culture in the second sense 
we can see how the constitutional order provides resources for us to address one another as members of a shared community in the midst of persisting disagreement. Adjudication does not simply shut down political conflict. Because officials accountable to the public have authority to make binding decisions about constitutional questions, adversaries have reasons to translate their case into constitutional frameworks capable of persuading others in the community who don't share their views. Because there are multiple fora in which adversaries can press their case, adversaries have reason to persist in constitutional argument even when they lose. Conflict iterates across the system over time. In this system, closure and openness each matter. Persons literate in constitutional culture understand they are subject to the authority of decision makers whom they must persuade, yet whose authority they also know how to contest. Let me just say that again. Persons literate in constitutional culture understand they are subject to the authority of decision makers whom they must persuade, yet whose authority they also know how to contest. The need to persuade and the, need and the ability to contest each play a part in sustaining engagement and thus enabling community and disagreement. Looking at the conflict over same-sex marriage through the lens of constitutional culture, we can see how Americans acting in courts, legislatures, and civil society argued in ways that created Obergefell's conditions of plausibility and are continuing to argue in the decision's wake as they try to shape Obergefell's meaning for the next phase of conflict. The debate surrounding Kim Davis, the Kentucky clerk who invoked religious liberty as she refused to officiate at same-sex marriages, as well as the debate now raging over Justice Scalia's replacement on the Supreme Court, shows that Americans have understandings about the ways citizens and officials must respect and may properly resist judicial authority and are prepared to continue arguing with one another about it. Backlash theory is incurious about the understandings that guide and structure conflict. Often, accounts of backlash view conflict as a threat to law and a threat to community without examining the changing meanings that conflict creates or the web of relationships that conflict forges. There is, in fact, a growing body of scholarship that probes elements of the backlash thesis, but it has had remarkably little effect on legal argument about backlash in the United States. This is at least in part because, I'm going to suggest in closing, claims about backlash appear descriptive, but they are in part also prescriptive. In the US, talk about backlash can appeal to the legal authority of realism as part of shared, a stock of shared reasons for judicial decision. Consider how the backlash claims of progressives and conservatives diverged as the debate over marriage evolved. Over time, progressives have shifted from an argument about whether courts could intervene on behalf of minority rights to claims about when and how courts should intervene on behalf of minority rights. In invoking Roe, Justice Ginsburg was not warning judges to stay out of the business of vindicating rights, but instead cautioning judges about how best to intervene. She's saying, don't move too far too fast. Conservatives, by contrast, have invoked backlash as a reason for courts to stay out of the marriage debate and leave re resolution of the question to the political process. These various strands of backlash discourse are often tangled up together. In his Obergefell dissent, Chief Justice Roberts cited Justice Ginsburg and the abortion debate as a reason that the majority was wrong to recognize the constitutional rights of same-sex couples to marry. Progressive and conservative claims on backlash illustrate a rich paradox. A claim about the institutional weakness of courts has developed into a discourse, a form of talk for directing the exercise of judicial power. So these Americans are knowing how to argue out of courts and they're essentially using claims of weakness to say where the courts should rule. If we examine talk of backlash through the lens of constitutional culture, we can see that in 21st century America, talk of backlash has emerged as a key language for legitimating and discrediting the work of courts. In the US, that understanding gives rise to an urgent need to pry apart the positive and the prescriptive in an effort better to describe the very different roles that courts can play in vindicating rights, a project that's distinct from, though plainly entangled with, normative questions concerning the roles that courts should play in vindicating rights. <laughs>
Including my, in concluding my story in this setting, however, I'm going to return to the comparative questions I raised in opening. In listening to this story about the path of the Supreme Court's same-sex marriage judgment in the United States, you might also hear questions for national and regional courts in Europe. What are the points of similarity and difference in our respective constitutional cultures? In understanding why some legislatures and some courts will recognize same-sex marriage while others will not, should we focus on understandings of sexuality and the family across the United States and Europe? Or should we focus instead on what is like and different in our respective federal systems? Is Obergefell properly compared to a European Court of Human Rights judgment like Oliari, which recently ordered Italy to recognize civil unions for same-sex couples? Are there reasons that some courts are more deferential to majorities, or that some citizens are more deferential to courts? Do citizens and officials have different understandings about respecting and resisting courts in our various constitutional democracies? I have modeled the US stories in ways that treat all of these relationships as significant dimensions of constitutional culture. All are potentially relevant if we want to think comparatively about the ways that constitutional culture enables constitutional change. And I look forward to discussing with you the model I've given of the US and the questions of comparison that it raises. So there.